Hello, I am Dr. Lakshmi Kumar. I am consultant interventional radiologist in Pace Hospitals, Hyderabad. Today, we will discuss about a common medical condition called deep vein thrombosis. To understand what is deep vein thrombosis, we have to first understand what is a vein. So, there are majorly two kinds of blood vessels in our body, arteries and veins. Arteries bring blood from the heart to the body. Veins, what the vein does is, they bring the blood back from the body to the heart. So, these are called veins. So, in the legs, there are two kinds of veins. One is superficial veins and second one is deep veins. Superficial veins are located close to the skin surface, whereas deep veins are located deeper within the uh, leg. So, when the blood in the deep veins gets clotted, this is called deep vein thrombosis. So, there are several risk factors for deep vein thrombosis, but the common risk factors are prolonged immobilization. Immobilization means not changing your position that is either sitting or sleeping position for a long time. That means more than 4 to 5 hours you are not changing the position that is the number one risk factor for developing deep vein thrombosis. This uh, prolonged immobilization can ha happen during a long distance travel or if you are uh, advised bed rest either due to surgery or some medical condition or due to any accident that is one more condition. Also in paralytic patients who are not able to move. So, these are all the risk factors where we experience prolonged immobilization which in turn lead to a risk of developing deep vein thrombosis. Other risk factor is if you had a history of previous deep vein thrombosis that is also a risk for developing a deep vein thrombosis again. So, other conditions like uh, obesity, pregnancy, smoking, family history, these are all risk factors. Certain medical conditions like uh, heart failure, kidney diseases, cancer patients, varicose vein patients, these are also prone to develop deep vein thrombosis. And uh, if you are on certain medications like uh, oral contraceptive pills, hormone replacement therapy or uh, cancer uh, drugs like chemotherapy drugs, then you are also prone to develop deep vein thrombosis. Symptoms uh, commonly in acute deep vein thrombosis what happens is the wherever the veins are affected that part gets swollen but means it increases in size and there will be increase in the local temperature and redness and pain. These are all the symptoms of acute deep vein thrombosis. If the deep vein thrombosis persists for more than 14 days and some people say more than one month, then it is called chronic deep vein thrombosis. Chronic deep vein thrombosis patients, they usually have symptoms similar to those patients which have varicose veins. So, these patients are more prone to develop varicose veins. If you have a chronic deep vein thrombosis for more than one month, you are more prone to develop uh, varicose veins if, if you are not treated properly. So, this uh, condition is called post thrombotic syndrome. You will have a varicose veins, swelling of limbs, uh, and also pain in the limbs, heaviness, itching, darkening of the skin of the legs, and also chronic non healing skin wounds. These are all the symptoms of post thrombotic syndrome. Uh, this will develop if you are not adequately treated for your acute deep vein thrombosis. The deep vein thrombosis as we discussed have symptoms like uh, swelling, redness, pain. So, these symptoms can also be seen in other conditions like uh, cellulitis that is infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. Also in uh, lymphedema that is filariasis or elephantiasis uh, and in patients with varicose veins and in uh, some conditions like uh, Baker's cyst, some cyst, local cyst rupture around the knee joint. 
these are all patients can have similar symptoms. So, how do you pinpoint that these symptoms are due to the deep vein thrombosis? That can be done by uh, examination or uh, by a, a certified physician and by doing certain tests. These tests uh, are done based on your risk category. Based on the symptoms and local examination findings by the uh, doctor, you can be classified into a low risk patient or a high risk patient for DVT. So, if uh, doctor thinks you are a patient uh, having low risk to develop DVT, then a blood test is ordered that is D dimer blood test. If this D dimer blood test comes negative, that means and you are also uh, a low risk patient. So, low risk plus negative D dimer means there is very less chance that you have DVT. So, there is no need to order any other blood test or any other imaging test. In second case, if either your D dimer test is positive or you are a high risk patient, then you need to undergo additional tests. This additional test, the most common test used is the ultrasound. In ultrasound, what we will see, we will check the, how the blood flow in your affected portion of the body, that is most commonly the leg. So, how is the blood flow in the leg that we will check using the ultrasound. If the flow is not proper and the blood is stagnant there, then we can confidently diagnose deep vein thrombosis. So, in certain situations where we cannot see the veins using ultrasound like the veins located in the pelvis that is the lower part of your abdomen or in the some uh, portions of the abdomen where the ultrasound beams cannot penetrate so that we cannot uh, see the veins situated there. In those situations, we will order CT or MRI preferably uh, with a contrast, intravenous contrast. Contrast is nothing but a dye which will increase the visualization of your blood vessels. So, these are the blood tests uh, and the imaging tests ordered. Also, to know the risk factors, what is the cause that uh, led to development of this uh, deep vein thrombosis, we will do other tests. If the cause is obvious like uh, prolonged immobilization, like long distance travel or bed rest, then there is no need to order other tests. If the cause is not obvious, then we can uh, order other tests like uh, as we discussed uh, to rule out the risk factors like some medical conditions like uh, kidney diseases or heart failure or cancers or any genetic uh, diseases like uh, factor 5 lead-in mutation or uh, prothrombin gene mutation. So, these are all the tests that we will uh, order uh, depending upon the uh, risk factors and the situation of the patient. So, the main objective uh, for the treatment of deep vein thrombosis is to prevent pulmonary embolism. What is pulmonary embolism? So, the deep vein uh, clots that developed in the legs, they can break from there and they can travel into the lungs. So, when they travel to the lungs, they can block the veins in the lungs. So, what happens if the veins in the lungs blocked? So, uh, whatever the oxygen that you get into the body that comes uh, from the airways, from the airways it the oxygen uh, goes into the pulmonary veins and then it uh, circulates to the rest of the body. So, the main source of oxygen to our body is from the lung and from the lung blood vessels. So, if the lung blood vessels are blocked due to these clots, the oxygen levels in your body will drop. So, the body organs will stop functioning. So, it can be fatal. So, this is the major risk factor due to the deep vein thrombosis. So, the main purpose uh, to treat deep vein thrombosis is to prevent this pulmonary embolism. So, other other aims are to decrease the local symptoms, to decrease the local swelling, pain, edema, redness. So, these are all sh should be controlled. Uh, 
number one is the medicines. What medicines? Anticoagulants. What are anticoagulants? Anticoagulants are blood thinning medications. So, what they do is they prevent formation of a new clot. You already developed clot. They are not doing anything to break the clot. They only prevent formation of a new clot. So, they will halt the progression of the deep vein thrombosis. The some common examples of anticoagulants are heparin and the warfarin. These are the commonly used medications. So, if the patient uh, even after giving these medicines is continuing to have the symptoms, severe symptoms like severe swelling, severe redness, sometimes there can be bluish discoloration of the skin and the leg, whole leg due to excessive clot burden in the veins. That condition is called phlegmasia serelia dolans. This can be a limb threatening condition. What is limb threatening condition means? Due to blockage of heavy blockage of uh, extensive uh, blockage of the veins in your uh, leg, the blood circulation to the limb gets compromised. Whenever the blood circulation gets compromised, uh, the leg muscles and whatever the structures in the leg, they will not get the proper nutrients and oxygen. So, they will start uh, the cells in the muscles and all the other uh, parts in the leg, they will start slowly dying. So, if uh, this number of cells uh, uh, affected increases, this can lead to uh, uh, gangrene of the whole limb. Gangrene means uh, the death of the tissue. So, if the whole limb is uh, threatened, then you may need amputation of the limb. Amputation means uh, you may need uh, uh, removal of that part of the body. That means uh, your leg needs to be removed. So, that is very unfortunate situation that can develop due to a severe deep vein thrombosis. So, so, if the patient is having a very severe DVT that can lead to this condition, then in those situations only the medicines cannot treat the DVT completely effectively. So, in those situations, we the interventional radiologist have a, a very uh, good uh, treatment choice to decrease the risk of developing this phlegmasia serelia dolens and to save the limb and to reduce the severe symptoms. So, number one is thrombolysis, DVT thrombolysis. What is thrombolysis means in, in difference to the anticoagulants, we will give thrombolytics at the location of the clotted veins. The anticoagulants, they prevent forming a new blood clot, whereas the thrombolytic medicine, it dissolves the clot that is already formed. So, we will uh, introduce a thin tube called a catheter under ultrasound and x-ray guidance in the vein that is affected with the help of a small needle and we will pass that thin tube into the affected portion of the vein and through that catheter, that catheter will have multiple side holes. So, through that catheter, we will inject this thrombolytic or blood dissolving medicine. So, this medicine is injected over a prolonged time or 12 hours or 24 hours and we will check what is the response. So, this uh, treatment is very effective if the patient is having acute deep vein thrombosis uh, that is less than 14 days, this is very effective. One more option that we have with interventional radiology is mechanical thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy. In mechanical thrombectomy, what we do is we will introduce a catheter. This catheter is different from that previous catheter that we used for the catheter directed thrombolysis. This catheter has a metal at the tip of the catheter which will rotate or it will suck out the thrombus. So, this will mechanically break the thrombus instead of you infusing a drug, you are mechanically breaking the clot. So, here the a clot burden removal is faster and it is 
more effective than the catheter directed thrombolysis, particularly in a chronic DVT patients or a subacute DVT that means more than 14 days or near the 14 days, they are more beneficial for those kind of patients. Also in patients in whom we cannot give the thrombolytic drugs due to some medical conditions like uh, if you are more prone for bleeding like uh, recent history of uh, heart attack or brain stroke or any recent surgery or any recent uh, accident then these are all indic uh, these are all situations where we cannot give the thrombolytic uh, medicine so in this patient population we can use this mechanical thrombectomy procedure so with this procedure either catheter directed thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy we can significantly reduce the clot burden and the symptoms are, are relieved in an expedited manner and the limb can be saved. The risk factor is, uh, the risk is uh, bleeding. Bleeding is, uh, this risk is less than 1%. A major bleeding risk is uh, almost uh, less than 0.5%. So, the bleeding can happen anywhere in the body. So, to prevent that bleeding due to our treatment, we will continuously monitor your blood uh, bleeding or clotting parameters while you are on that treatment. So, we will continuously monitor uh, what is the bleeding tendency in your body and we will adjust the dose accordingly. So, with a good protocol approach and a good institutional management, we can reduce the uh, risk of the bleeding due to our interventional treatment. So, it is usually takes 1 to 3 hours for the treatment to complete. The deep vein thrombosis prevention can be different for different categories of patients. If you are a patient with medical condition, or a hospitalized patient, some medical conditions like a cancer patient or a hospitalized patient due to surgery, high risk surgery like a bone surgery or joint surgery or a cancer surgery or you are in a, some cancer uh, curing medicines like chemotherapy medicines, then you are a high risk patients. These patients are given anticoagulants that is a blood thinning medications, either heparin or uh, warfarin or etc. So, that is one type of uh, prevention. For some low risk patients with low risk surgeries, uh, we will uh, advise uh, one more uh, device called inflation compression devices. What these inflation compression devices they do is, they are wrapped around the legs and intermittently they are, infl they are inflated with the air. So, uh, whenever you inflate them with the air, the it will increase the pressure around the leg. So, it will improve the circulation from the leg and it will prevent the clotting of the veins. So, that is one, one other uh, uh, modality that we can use to prevent deep vein thrombosis. So, in for general population, uh, the most common risk factor to develop deep vein thrombosis is prolonged immobilization as we discussed. Prolonged immobilization is the uh, most common risk factor. So, whenever you are uh, about to experience a prolonged immobilization due to a long distance travel like 4 to 5 hours travel uh, in a car or flight, what we recommend is uh, uh, to move uh, every 1 hour to get up and move, uh, wear loose fitting clothes, not tight clothes, avoid uh, putting cross legging that is le one leg over the other and avoid uh, some uh, sedatives or alcohol or sleeping pills during this long distance travel. Also flexing and extending your uh, ankles and knees whenever possible and one more thing is you can wear compression stockings. So, these are all the uh, uh, precautions that you can take to prevent a DVT while you are about to experience a prolonged immobilization. So, the DVT patients, they are prone to develop uh, DVT again. 
that is the number one risk. So, whenever uh, you are experiencing uh, symptoms again like uh, swelling, redness or uh, pain, it is better to contact your nearby physician immediately. That is number one. Second is, if you are on uh, medicines to prevent the DVT, that is the anticoagulants, you are on a high risk for developing bleeding complications. So, why? Because these anticoagulants, they will uh, prevent the blood from cl clotting. So, if whenever there is a small injury, you are more prone to develop more bleeding. So, for example, uh, if you are uh, playing contact uh, sports, physical sports, even with a sm uh, small injury, you are prone to develop more bleeding. So, you have to take uh, these precautions to avoid uh, high contact uh, physical sports uh, like using uh, soft bristled toothbrushes and uh, to prevent nose bleeding, you can use humidifiers if you are living in a dry climate or cold climate and uh, you are using proper uh, paddings or helmets whenever you are about to experience uh, high contact uh, sports. So, these are all the precautions that you can take. One more uh, special precaution is uh, even if you are on blood thinning medications, you may develop pulmonary embolism after even after discharge of the hospital. So, you have to know what are the symptoms of pulmonary embolism. So, as we discussed pulmonary embolism is the a blood clot breaking from the deep veins in the legs and it travels to the lung blood vessels and it blocks the blood vessels there that is called pulmonary embolism. With this you can uh, uh, develop decreased oxygen in your blood and you can develop various symptoms like light headedness. If you uh, experience a decreased blood uh, oxygen to the brain, you can experience light headedness. Also increase the heart rate and uh, chest discomfort, these are all the symptoms of pulmonary embolism. So, if you develop any of these conditions, you have to contact your nearby hospital on an emergency basis this, because this is a fatal condition and it needs to be addressed at the earliest time possible. When handling sharp things like knives or blades, you have to be extra careful if you are on blood thinning medicines. Also, wearing a bracelet or a necklace or a tag. Uh, which shows that you are using this particular medicine, that, that particular anticoagulant or blood thinner medicine and name and uh, contact number of the emergency contact person that you are close relative or friend that needs to be uh, mentioned and also your medical condition. These are all the things that needs to be mentioned on that tag or the necklace or bracelet. You need to wear this uh, bracelet or necklace or tag all the time so that in an unfortunate situation uh, where it you you developed certain uh, accident or you are involved in certain accident or some complication developed in a middle of, in the middle of the road or uh, in certain unknown place so and you are not able to explain your situation and your medical condition to other people then they can see this tag and they will know that this person is suffering from this medical condition and this person is using this particular medicine. So, th that can help significantly help the treatment. So, how it can help is if it is mentioned that uh, you are taking this particular medicine, then there are antidotes for that medicine. Most of the drugs that we prescribe for thinning the blood, they have antidotes. So, if we know the particular medicine that you are taking, then we can give the correct antidote for that medicine. So, your life can be saved uh, because if you wear that bracelet or the necklace or the tag. Yes, it is dangerous. If it is severe, it can be uh, dangerous to the limb that is affecting, uh, that is affected by the DVT or if the clot in that uh, vein breaks and travels to the lung causing pulmonary embolism, it can be fatal. So, yes, DVT is dangerous. There are only few conditions, medical conditions which can be cured completely. Cure means it is, it will not recur again. 
So there are only few conditions that can be cured. Most of the conditions can be treated. What is treatment is we can decrease the symptoms due to that condition and we can prevent long term discomfort due to that condition and we can prevent the recurrence of that uh, condition. So DVT can be treated but cannot be cured completely. Yes, it can be hereditary. It can develop due to certain genetic mutations like factor V leaden mutation or antithrombin deficiency or prothrombin gene mutation. So these are all some hereditary conditions which can predispose to developing DVT in the family member. So if you have a sibling or a parent who is affected with DVT, you are more prone to develop DVT. In certain conditions like uh, antithrombin deficiency, there is a 50% chance of that person to develop a clot in any of the vein in their lifetime. Yes, DVT is hereditary in certain patients. If the clot button is very small, they can dissolve and they can disappear. So when the clot button is very small, it can cure itself. But to know whether the clot button is small or it's moderate or severe, you have to be uh, assessed by a proper physician and need to undergo the tests prescribed by the physician. And then only we can say uh, whether it can uh, be cured on itself or should we give uh, medicines or you, do you, you need to undergo interventional um, techniques. Mild, mild forms of DVT are generally treated by general physicians or surgeons. If it is severe, then we need to do interventional techniques, percutaneous interventional techniques. These are generally for, performed by the interventional radiologists or vascular surgeons who are trained in the this percutaneous interventional radiology techniques. Thank you.